Hey. Right. <laughs> We're doing you a favor. Yes. We're doing you a favor. You don't have to wake up and be here in the morning. It's only going to cost you. All right. So one of the things that I like to look at when we're talking about financial pieces is that everybody has, like, just like they have their own money beliefs, they have their, we have our own um, definitions of every term that we think of around money. So you hear a certain word, and the question is not what's the dictionary definition, but how do you define it? Is there something in your past, you know, is, is the word rich or does the word wealthy have a negative connotation? What we want to work through with people is what is their definition of all of these different terms? Because a lot of times there is a negative connotation. And that can limit them from, or limit us, from having the perspective that's going to allow us to really grow into having these positive results that we were talking about before the break. So some of the words that I like to define are things like wealth. Is wealth a good thing or a bad thing? What is wealth? Um, what's, what incorporates wealth into your life? And so the basic term is having wealth in the dictionary. That's literally what it says. Being wealthy is to have wealth. And it's marked by abundance, which I never really knew that, that those two words were actually tied together. And so that could be a positive belief, but if somebody doesn't carry that positive belief and every time you say wealth, internally they're cringing, you're not going to be able to have a positive conversation about it because it's not something that they want. So if there is, especially for people that grew up from a biblical perspective, I always talk about the story where it says that the, it's easier for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what that really means? I'm going to tell you right now. Uh -oh. Sorry. <laughs> You're gonna ruin my. <laughs> Do you want to? Just ignore the man I love in the back. Story, Would you like to come up here? No, no, no. I'm gonna tell it from the way that I learned it, and I'm sure it's different. So then you can come up here and you can tell it too. Okay, so easier for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I grew up in Sunday school, so I specifically remember cutting out a camel out of the little construction paper. And then they'd hand us a needle, and we'd have our camel, and we'd have the needle, and we're trying to put one through the other, and it's not possible. So what is that programming my tiny little subconscious mind? You can't get into heaven if you're wealthy. If you're rich. Yeah, I don't want to be this camel. Like, I can't, I, I'll never go there. And in that perspective, there are only two choices. You can go here or here. So the question is, if I don't want to go here, I better not ever get rich. And especially when I'm working with female entrepreneurs who grew up with that mindset or remember the construction paper and the needle, they're wondering why they're not making money. And on a subconscious level, they're completely blocking because if they make too much money, they're going here. And they don't want to go there because they don't, you know, but that's that they don't want to be one of those people. So they create this complete dichotomy where they can never get rich. Because if they did, so they self-sabotage over and over and over and over and over again. When the Bible story, actually, when it talks about the rich man, it's actually the greedy rich man is the way that it translates, I think. Now, we do have a Hebrew scholar here. So I'm going to invite my Hebrew scholar to the front of the room, and he's going to give you the full story. Yes. You, here, you got to have this. No. This is great. <laughs> So in the biblical time of the days, <clears throat> there was the city wall that existed, right? There's this big giant wall. And when they talked about the needle, the reason they say it was harder for the camel to get through the eye of a needle than it was for the rich man to get in heaven is that there was a door in this wall. And what happened is that this door went like this. And when you were looking at the wall, there would be a guy standing here, and the doorway, which went into the city, was called the needle. And so, biblically, the reason it was so hard is that when you had the camel, he literally had to get down on his knees 
get everything off the camel, get the person off the camel, and the camel had to crawl through the wall to get into, into the city. And it was a way that they protected themselves from marauders and the bandits out in the desert coming in and just storming the city and robbing them. Because the camel had to very slowly, without anything on it, walk through, crawl through the needle to get into the city. So it's possible, it's just difficult. Right. <laughs> so now we've, had, now we've had our Hebrew lesson for the day. Impossible, right. And so it really does come down to what were you taught and what was the perspective and what were those beliefs based off of and that for so many people that has crippled them for their entire lives when it's when it's just a mistranslation just like the saying money is the root of all evil well it's the love of money is the root of all evil but what does that what does the word love mean it's greed or being unwilling to share it or being unwilling to make a difference in your community and so that's been something that has limited people for a long time based off of a mistranslation I didn't know that that's the needle, but it's possible. It's just that it might take a little bit more perspective because you have to humble yourself. You have to be willing to be giving back to the community as well and not be greedy and hang on to all of it for yourself. So these are some of those conversations that people don't realize that, you know, when it wasn't until I hadn't even thought about that story till I was doing, having that, doing the talk on the money soundtrack and somebody else in the audience raised their hand and said it. And it knocked me on my butt because I was like, I, rem like, I remembered myself with the needle and myself with the camel. And I was like, ah. bad teacher. huh? Bad. bad teacher, yeah. <laughs> bad teacher. These are some of those conversations that if you had just a short period of time that you could speak, bring, people, bring them to the perspective of understanding what it, how they're defining these terms for themselves. What about abundance? Anybody, what comes to mind when you hear the word abundance? Lots of. Lots of. Okay. A surplus, maybe? Mm -hmm. What else? Anything? Happiness. Happiness. Okay. There's some emotion tied into it. Fulfillment. So the actual definition is an extremely plentiful or oversufficient quantity or supply. Overflowing fullness, affluence, and wealth. So they actually define each other. And so we talk about abundance a lot of times, but some people stray away from saying wealth because they don't want to, to use the words and say, I want to be wealthy. They're okay saying I want to be abundant, but what they don't realize is that they're saying that I want to be wealthy. So it's an important piece to begin to teach people about how they are really defining those terms. And this is another piece of that mindset conversation, is just continuing to go through that. The last piece of the mindset conversation is the money personality. And this is something that the money couple does really well. And I like to touch on it because every once in a while when I'm speaking, someone will raise their hand and say, it's not that I don't think I can afford it. I just really like to save money. Is that a bad thing? And I say, no, that's just the way you're wired. There's a couple called the money couple. And what they did is they did some research to figure out how people are naturally wired for understanding money. And there's five choices. The first are your spenders. Your spenders are the people who love to spend money so much that they will spend money on other people. These are your gift buyers. They just love spending money. How many in the room do we have? Yeah, Andre for sure. <laughs> what about your savers? Your savers are people who love saving money so much that they're the ones posting the coupons when there's a sale because they want everybody else to save money. These are the people that get the 30% off coupon to Kohl's, plus they get an extra 20% off, plus they wake up at 4 in the morning for an early bird, and they know when the sales are, and then they're going to tell you how much they saved, and they're going to be so excited that they're going to want you to go with them because they wouldn't want you to pay full price. Those are your savers. How many savers do we have in the room? The two, yep. Then there are your security seekers. These are the people who love to have security. And this does not necessarily mean that they don't spend money. They'll actually spend more money if they know that it's secure. And so they'll spend extra money on the best tires ever available just so that they know that they're safe. 
Your risk takers are people that maybe they aren't into the stock market. I'm a risk taker, I'm not into the stock market. But most entrepreneurs are risk takers because they're willing to take a gamble on themselves. If it's something that they're really passionate about, they will take that risk. And your last group are the flyers. These are people who just never even think about money. They are all about experience and relationship. And when they have those experiences and those, that relationship, they're not even thinking about the fact that they're spending money until the bill shows up. And they're like, oh my god, that costs that much money? I can't even believe it because they weren't thinking about it. That's Rima. OK, we have a flyer in the room. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So if we go back to that equation, we've really gone through all of the pieces of our, the money soundtrack conversation. So you start out with your money soundtrack. You up the power with your money anthem. You add to it the understanding of your money personality. And you get your financial power. So this is a way to incorporate all of those different pieces into having that money mindset conversation with people. And you can just use basic definition of a few terms. You can use the full money story conversation. You can talk about past experiences. You can talk about what they heard, if they heard their parents fighting about money. And you could even bring in using the money personalities to know how to speak to each other about money in relationship. So there are so many different topics that are within this one step one of the process. All right, next we have the N, or step two, navigating your expenses. So the first piece that I like to do with this is defining the word budget. Bouge, <laughs> or it's a cuss word. It could either be a really fancy French word or it could be a four letter word, depending on your attitude towards budget. And your attitude towards budget has a lot to do with what? Your money soundtrack. If your, parent, if your mom hated budgeting and always complained about budgeting, do you think you're going to like budgeting? No, you're going to hate it. And you're probably going to be a spender because it's going to be easier. You're going to want to counteract what you were raised with. Whatever, Trudy. Yeah. <laughs> so what is a budget? It's an estimate of income and expenditure for a set period of time. That's it. Why do we get so emotional about it? Why do we torment ourselves? Why do we think that it's something that we have to avoid like the plague? It's really just an estimate of your income and your expenditures for a set period of time, like a monthly budget. So teaching people how to budget is a really cool way for them to get away from the negative association with it and use it as a tool to help them to stay on track. So the conversation to have, and this comes quite a bit from the Jennifer Madsen's book, uh, Financial Minute, is what's the real intent of the budget? If it's only to get to the end of the month, turn around and beat yourself up for the, all the bad decisions that you made, <laughs> how many of you want to sign up for the budget? No, thank you. So one of the things that you can do is begin to redefine or rename the budget so that you have a clear definition of what it means to you. So that could be a prosperity plan. If you're a spender, it's a spending plan. If you're a saver, it's a savings plan. A financial plan, your villa in Italy plan, your travel fund. Whatever it is that is going to motivate you to want to track your income and expenses. So beginning to have that conversation about redefining budgets is a really important step because it gets people into the mood of, OK, I guess I'll budget. Or even better, yes, I'd love to budget because I really, really, really want to buy that villa in Italy someday. So I've created a really basic, customizable budget worksheet that our clients can use. And what it does is it allows them to track their income and expenses. And within their income and expenses, it tracks the fixed and the variable line items. So the first piece of budgeting is just to get very clear on what's coming in the door and what's going out. That's fixed. So if you have wages that are consistent, uh, in, 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 uh, income, investment income that's consistent, those are the pieces that you would put in there first. If you're an entrepreneur and things are a little bit more up and down, flexible, then what you'll look at is what's, your, what's the 
a decent average over three to six months so that you're not at your lowest point, but you're also not at your highest point for creating that budget. So they do this whole beginning piece, which has their wages, their interest income, any investment income, miscellaneous income. If they're self-employed, it has a piece for them to deduct their federal taxes, state income taxes, Social Security or self-employment tax, so that that doesn't get missed. And at the bottom, it's going to have their total spendable income. So you want to figure out what's coming in first. Then you're going to track expenses. Those are things, there are the fixed expenses, stuff you have to pay every month, rent, mortgage, car payment, car insurance, um, anything else that's fixed, gas and electric, those kind of things. So all of those would get put in there. And then there's all of the other stuff that we don't really know what we're spending money on, right? And that's where we use this idea of tracking. So when you're teaching tracking, what you want to focus on is just getting people to be willing to commit to a set period of time of tracking all of the money that they're spending. And what this does is it creates a new habit of awareness. Because what happens for most people that end up with a credit card or a debit card is it's really easy to swipe and not even pay attention to how much you're spending. I am very guilty of this. I'll go to the grocery store, buy whatever I want, swipe, pay, not even realize what I just spent. No clue. Same thing at the gas station. I just swipe the card, pump the gas, okay, got to go, I'm on the phone. I don't know how much money I just spent. So tracking is a way that we can stop and say, I'm just going to write down every single line item before I spend the money. Whether it's check, cash, or credit, if you write it down, then you're just noticing. It's not to judge anything. It's not to necessarily stop you from spending, but it's to give you a new level of awareness of where your money's going before you make that decision so that it keeps you in a more powerful place of decision making. So the idea is to carry around a tiny notebook and a pen everywhere you go, and when you're about to spend the money, write it down before you spend the money. So that you're reminding yourself that you're about to spend money. Look at me, I'm about to spend $25.32. Huh, isn't that interesting? And maybe you'll say, huh, I'm about to spend $25.32 on that. I don't really want that. I choose to spend my money somewhere else. But the point is not to keep yourself from buying it. It's to just build that awareness to be paying attention to what you're spending. So every single thing. And what I love that Trudy recommended and did, it's probably been at least a year now, huh, Trudy? A little over a year. She, started, she said, fine, if you're going to make me track your, my expenses, I'm going to track when money shows up. So she had a separate tracking book, and every time money showed up, she wrote it down. That was find a quarter on the floor. Uh, find a $20 bill in a jacket pocket that you haven't used since last summer or last winter. If somebody, a friend buys you coffee. Uh, somebody picks up the bill at lunch. You write down all of the times that money's actually flowing into your life that you weren't expecting. And. Actually, when you weren't expecting it, too. That's what really true. got me on to well, damn, because I was thinking to myself, I'm always broke. I'm always, I don't make enough money. That's what was playing in my mm -hmm. head. And so when I started tracking, at the end of the month, I went, well, I do make enough money. <laughs> now what? <laughs> I can't use that excuse anymore. Right. In comes this, and I was like, oh. Oh, that's where it's going. <laughs> yep. That's probably why it doubled the next month. My income doubled. <laughs> yeah, because you start paying attention yeah. to it, and where you're putting your energy, you build flow around that. And so you're putting your energy into tracking when the money's showing up. When you get those random checks from a um, class action lawsuit you didn't know you were a part of, or your printer cartridge. Um, ink returns, whatever. Every time money shows up, if you write it down and you put a green star on your calendar, what you'll find is money shows up every single day. And when you create that flow, more and 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 more money shows up. So what do you do when the money shows up? Every single time, you do the money dance. <laughs> so the idea with that is that you can actually physically anchor that positive emotion in your body 
by doing something in, with movement. So when I have a big enough group, I make everybody stand up and do their money dance, which is a great break. Yeah? What were you doing the money dance about? Yay! <laughs> so you can just do like, just, some, just something that you're like, yeah, this is awesome. I have friends that every time money shows up, they, they run a, semin a really successful seminar business. So every time they get their money from their online sales, they have a song that they love and they turn it on and they dance the whole song in their living room. The whole song. Every single time. Because money keeps showing up. So it's a cool way to physically anchor that exercise and that acknowledgement so that the money keeps showing up. So if you're going to track the expenses, track the money that comes in, and then use an average of that tracking to be able to put back into that budget sheet so that you get really clear about where that money's going. So are yeah. You, are you saying, like, if you're in the grocery store, and I usually do that self-checkout thing, so I've checked everything out, and then now pull up my little book and write down what I'm about to take down. Yes. And if there's a long line, then at least stop for a second. Oh, okay. Acknowledge the amount. Huh, I'm about to spend that much money on groceries. And then when you get to the car, write it down so that you're not the one that, the one person that still stops at the grocery store <laughs> checkout and writes a check. You know those people? You're like, really? Yeah. Really? Oh, I wrote the wrong date. Sorry. Oh, I did this. Oh, just, writer. yeah, hurry up. Why can't you just swipe your card like everybody else? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. They could have been getting prepared ahead of time to write their check. So this is the way to, a cool way to uh, introduce budgeting in the steps. So the first thing is just what's fixed, what do you know is coming in and going out, and then figuring out those variable pieces. How do you track? This allows you to introduce the concept of the money dance, and then you can transition into the idea of the funnel. So then you can talk about once you know where all of your money is going, you can make some new decisions about where you're spending that money. And some of the places you can save money are health insurance, life insurance, your utilities, your cable, internet, 401k, IRA, mortgage, cell phone, tax return, all of the stuff that we normally talk about. And you want to look at that both for personal and business. And then once that money, once you've reappropriated the money, you can actually take that money and you use that for step three, which is charting your course to your financial dreams by being able to set some money aside for savings. So there's a lot of pieces that you could go a lot deeper into if you're doing this from a presentation perspective. You could run a whole workshop just on budgeting. You could teach tracking, have everybody actually bring their notebooks. You could hand out notebooks for everybody. There's a lot of different ways that you could incorporate this. And then you want to talk to them about the different things that they can save money on, who they can talk to about their insurances, um, whether or not they're paying for $120 or $150 or $200 for cable. If they're not using it, talk to them about a Roku box with a, an account for Hulu and Netflix and get rid of that whole bill. There's a lot of different creative ways that you can bring that up, calling your cell phone company once a year and getting on to whatever the new, less expensive plan is. Because they're upgrading those plans about once a year. And if you're not babysitting it, they'll just keep you on the old plan that costs more. But we've got to maybe set it in our calendars once a year to say, OK, during this month is when I reassess everything that I'm spending money on. Anything more that I can save, I can actually allot towards my savings plan. And if you do want the Google Drive system thing, that often applies to that if you call them before it's over, you can get it extended. Right. OK, so on the cable bill, if they want to keep their cable, as long as they get their pricing, their introductory pricing extended while they're still on that plan, they can usually continue on that same amount. It's after they bump you up that they don't want to take you back down to that lower price. So you've got to be a little bit more proactive about it. But if it's worth it, once you help them to do the, the third step, which is charting your course, they're, we're able to be clear about, OK, it's worth me taking three hours to crunch all these numbers to make sure if there's any more money that I can squeeze out gets me to my goals faster. All right, the next one is step three, what I call chart your course. 
And this is the idea of getting clear on goal setting and what they, what our clients really want to experience and what we want to experience financially. I always joke that as, especially as women, we're all sitting around with, with plenty of time, right? In between taking care of the kids, taking care of the house, taking care of sick parents, driving here, driving there, trying to run our businesses, we have plenty of time to sit and reflect about our perfect financial future. Right? Wrong. So that's t a lot of times people just don't want to take the time. They don't think that it's worth it. And if we can help them to at least get that, that clear goal, it's going to allow them to have a pi an image, a picture of what they're moving towards. So I like to look at the term prosperity in this area because prosperity, I think, has a much broader feel even than wealth and abundance. It feels like prosperity involves a lot of different segments of life. It's a successful, flourishing, or thriving condition, especially in financial respects or good fortune. So it's a successful, flourishing, and thriving condition. It's a great word to talk to people about in creating their financial vision is what will it feel like, what will it look like when you've reached a state of true prosperity. And there's two different pieces, I believe, in the prosperity planning. You've got your right brain or your heart. This is really the visualizing of the ideal future. How are you going to paint that picture for yourself? And then there's the left brain. And that's getting real with the numbers and us really working with them through how much they're going to need to save to get to that point. So the questions that you want people to be thinking about when they're really just on the dreaming side of things is where do you want to go? What does your ideal life look like? What does your safe harbor look like? What does your ideal work situation look like? What is your ideal work week? Do you want to retire? If so, when? What would that look like for you? What does life look like before retirement and after retirement? These are some of the things that will get people sort of thinking about what do I really want to experience in life. Because the money is just a tool, right? It's just the flow of energy. We work. We put out our effort. Money shows up. We find things that we deem valuable, and we give our money to those things. Just like our energy. We give our energy to work. Energy comes back in the form of money. We then give money to someone else who's exp expending their energy for something we find valuable. That's just, that's the whole thing with money. So one of the pieces that I've found is really valuable is talking to people about retirement. Because the old definition of retirement just doesn't work anymore. What's the old definition of retirement? Well, yeah, to, to be put out to pasture, technically. And I know a lot of 65-year-olds that aren't quite ready to be put out to pasture. They're just getting going in most cases because they finally have enough money and resources, the self-confidence, and they no longer give a crap about what anybody else thinks. So are they ready to retire? No. So retirement used to be go to high school, get good grades so you can get into a good college and get a degree so that you can go to work for a job for 30 years that you absolutely hate so that 30 years later you can get your gold watch and then you can sit in an Adirondack chair from 65 to 72 recovering from the job that you hate and die on your 72nd birthday. Anybody want to sign up for that plan? No, right? But that's really what all this retirement planning BS that's on, you know, that we're talking about, that's on commercials, that everyone else that's in the financial industry is talking about, it's crap. Because most people are, we're starting to pursue what it is that we love. So why in the world would you stop doing what you love arbitrarily on your 65th birthday? So most people don't feel motivated enough to retirement plan because they don't feel motivated by retirement. So there's got to be something new that takes the place of that if someone's going to give time and value and effort to planning their financial future. So a lot of that might be that instead of dreaming about traveling when they turn 65, it's how do we build a financial plan to allow them to travel now through 75 if they plan to work a little bit longer because they love what they do. 
really when we're talking about retirement, traditionally what it is is it's the idea that they get to a point where there's no longer any income and they have to have saved enough to survive the rest of their life without bringing in any more money. But if they love what they do, why are they going to stop bringing in money? Maybe they want more flexibility so that they can work nine months, take three months off because they love what they do. Why would they quit? Or they want to be able to take what they do on the road with them as they travel. And there's going to be some income coming in. So it's not the same planning strategies that people, they, a lot of people are still going down that road. But I don't see that it's working because there's enough people that are like, I don't want to do that. I love what I do. I just, I, I just turned 65. I got away from my crappy job, so now I can do what I really like. And there's going to be income associated with that. So retirement, by a real definition, is the act, action or fact of leaving one's job and ceasing to work. So what are you going to do? Everybody always says, oh, when I retire, I'm going to travel. Great. You're going to travel for one year with your husband, and you're going to come home, and you're going to want a part-time job to get away from him. <laughs> Or you say, oh, well, I want to take care of the grandkids. Great, but you're going to need a part-time job to avoid becoming the full-time babysitter. So it's not necessarily that you have to completely cease working. It's what do you want that to look like? So part of it is creating a dream board and picturing what that's going to be for the people that you're working with. And if they've got 10 countries that they want to visit, figure out how they can visit those 10 countries between now and when they croak. It doesn't have to be after 65. They don't have to try and save up a million dollars. What if we could figure out a way to help them supplement their income by $10,000 a year so that they have enough money to go on a trip every other year? By beginning a savings plan now, they could have enough money saved in five years that they could take that first trip instead of saying, I have to wait till I am 65 and arbitrarily quit working. So it's really helping people to move through that. Make sense? So that's really the right brain. Oh, come on. Why does it keep start, trying to start from the beginning? From current slide. There we go. Huh? Yeah. It's healthy sugar. Okay. So like we said, when I was introducing this the chart your course section, there's two pieces. There's the right brain, which is the visualization, the talking to people about what those goals are. That's really important because most people that are in the financial industry just assume it's like the what's your number commercial. What's your number that you're going to need to retire at 65? Well, 90% of the population maybe doesn't want to retire when they're 65, but here they are making, spending millions of dollars on an advertising campaign to convince you that you should have enough money saved at 65 when maybe that's not the life that you want. So if we can show up differently and talk to people about getting clear on what, the life, what is the life that you want and when, we can actually plan according to their goals and dreams instead of what we assume everybody wants, which really is probably not what at least half of the people that we're working with want. Then we can talk to them about the, right, the left side of the brain, which is the actual practical pieces. And this is really about Money 101. It's teaching people that there are the three different phases of money in their life. So there's the accumulation phase. This is the time when you're making money and you've got a lot of income coming in. Then there's the conservation phase, which is maybe you're making a little bit less money and you want to make sure that you protect what you have. And then there's the time to spend all the money that you saved. And helping people to see life in those different places, but also how that fits in with maybe a different perspective on retirement than they've had in the past. 
because there's a lot of fear and anxiety around, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to retire. Anybody ever heard anybody say that or ever thought it themselves? Oh my God, I'm not going to be able to retire. And if you stop and you ask them, what do you mean by retire? What does that look like? Most of them are going to say, well, I don't really actually want to retire, but I, somehow I've been told that I'm supposed to have stress and anxiety over the fact that I'm not going to be able to retire, but I don't really even want to retire. It's like, okay, then let's just remove that stress and anxiety and define it and look at it in a different perspective. And it shifts their conversation completely in their head to, to oh my God, I'm going to be able to create whatever I want, and who cares if it doesn't look like traditional retirement? I don't really want that anyway. But we have to be the ones to give them that permission to look at it from a different perspective because we're so programmed. Retirement has been the same conversation for over 100 years. So they're just thinking that that's what you're supposed to do. I've never been good at doing what you're supposed to do. So we can teach people not to do what they're supposed to do and do what they want to do. It's pretty cool. So then I talk about the three hurdles. See, is anybody recognizing these slides? <laughs> So the three things that usually get in the way of whatever that dream is. So you, you, you paint the picture of the dream of what they're going to want, and then what are the pieces that could get in their way? There's the debt, taxes, and inflation. So you can talk through debt, good debt, bad debt. Talk about how credit cards are guaranteed 18% interest and how it's impossible to get to out-earn bad debt. Then there's taxes understanding that we are in one of the lowest tax situations that we've ever been in in this country. And when the government is spending as many trillions of dollars per year as it is, and we're 17 trillion in debt right now with 119 trillion negative cash flow, the government has two choices if they're going to pay off their debt. When you're trying to balance your family budget, what are your choices? Spend less, spend less or make more. So is Uncle Sam going to spend less? So how does he make more? Taxes. People don't get it. They still don't get it. When you talk through it, that will help them. So this is a place where you could pick any one of these and do a napkin presentation to be able to explain how that's going to work. And then lastly, there's inflation. The idea that if we continue on the track that we're on to maintain your middle class income 40 years from now, you'll need an annual income of about $250,000. That's not to scare you, but it's to give you a number that you can really plan from. And maybe some of that annual income comes from continuing to work past 65. But some of that annual income, if you want to maybe be able to take some time off, needs to be able to come from some of the savings that you've set aside. And so the tools that we use with the tax-free savings plans allows people to not have to worry about that unknown factor, the big question mark of what is retirement really going to look like. And then we have three key growth principles. So these are the things that are actually going to support them in being able to create that dream. Compound interest, $5 a day, and tax avoidance. All three of these are just napkin presentations, again. And you'll learn all that, Rima. It's, um, it's really just, there's a, there's a drawing that goes along with every concept that we teach because people are visual learners. So if we can draw them a picture, it's way easier for them to understand than us standing there using big words, waving our arms around. It helps them to really be able to see how those things are going to work. Yeah, look at this monkey over here. You won't even notice what I'm doing. So compound interest. We teach through the idea of the 29-year-old triplets. So if you were to take the first piece is understanding that the compound interest is built on the, what's called the rule of 72. So you take the interest rate that your money's earning, you divide it into the number 72, and it will tell you how long it's going to take for your money to double. So if you can get 4%, 4 divides into 72 18 times. So if you have someone that starts out with $5,000, Every 18 years, that money's going to double. So when they get to 65, they'd, have, they'd turn their 5,000 into 20,000 without ever adding any money to it. If we go up to 8%, it'll double every nine years, which means that they'll end up with actually 80,000 when they hit 65. And if they can get up to 12%, they'll be at 320,000. 
So by doing this, it teaches, and you can actually draw it all out in front of them on a yellow pad, helps people to understand, wow, my interest rate, whether I'm borrowing money or earning money, really does make a big difference. Second thing is understanding compound interest versus simple interest and how things stack up. And then $5 a day. Understanding that $5 a day over 30 or oh, yeah, over a long period of time, 40 years at 10% interest would turn into a million dollars. Most people don't realize that small amounts of money with enough time do magic. So it's important to understand that piece. And then tax avoidance. So the difference between your dollar doubling, has everyone, should I do this one? I'll do this one on the whiteboard so that Rima can see it too. Bye-bye, camel. You were very cute. Okay. So there are really three different ways that our money gets taxed in this country. You have taxable, you have tax deferred, and you have tax free. I think this is one of the most powerful presentations if you have 10 minutes to present in front of a group that you can choose.